Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of studies. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off, uh, dealing with uh, placing Deborah and Beth Barak on a line. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this week and for this morning, for the time that we have to study your word again. We pray, Lord, that you can lead in this study, help us to organize these lines, that we can uh, get a preparation, or that we can prepare for the meetings this summer, where we will go through um, the book of Judges. And we pray, Lord, for the plans for these meetings. We ask, Lord, that you can continue to help us and guide us, um, that many people will be there who need to be there. And um, that uh, those who aren't there, that we will have meetings that will have uh, clear presentations for those that watch online. And that we can sum up all this that we've been doing over the last year. Uh, be with us now in this study with your spirit. And help us to understand these things. And to reflect your character. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. Um, so we've been putting Deborah and Barack on a line and, um, we're going to go there. Uh, so we were addressing some details of these lines, um, placing the events, uh, that we see here, so I'll just switch the screen. So we had marked these events, these events happening on this line. Um, so there's some of these things that need to be brought out specifically dealing with the 126 days and how they relate to this line going to November 9th. So those need to be drawn out so that we can kind of bring these lines together. And we were uh, wrestling then where we take these events in the story of Barack and Damara and how we line them up with the dates that we have on the line. So the dates from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th, 2019. So I do have different charts with all of these different dates on, but I think Samuel wanted me to sort of put them all together on a line. So I'm going to redraw some of these things and uh, show the logic of how we end up with this line of Deborah and Barak. So this line of Deborah and Barak is obviously addressing um, uh, th this Canaanite king, uh, whose sister is, the, that's Jabin, and Sisera is his general. And um, even though we have this specific line dealing with Deborah and Brack, we know that this, this history uh, goes back further. That is, uh, this, with Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, these are preparations for what ends up happening as being something internal within this movement, uh, where this test uh, occurs. And that's where... Uh, this movement is going to have this separation from this uh, enemy, which is represented by the teachings of Parminder. So, so I'm going to draw it out, and we're going to discuss it again. So this is basically a review of what we had done before. Okay, so when we're dealing with this enemy, um, Jabin is the king of Canaan, 
and he's one of the enemies that has been left in the land to test God's people, correct? Correct. Okay. Now we know this relates to 9-11. That is, this line goes from 9-11 to 2023. That is the story of the judges does that. But we had initially the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, addressing the arrival of the first angel's message. And, and those enemies are still mostly external enemies. Um, and uh, they're going to address the truths that are going to be brought to this movement after 9-11, right? And so this is a work of repentance, 9-11 awakens God's people, there's this work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's the understanding of the 2520 and the introduction of a detailed chronology to this movement. So when we deal with this line here, so I'm just going to do like this. We have that line where we're going from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th, 2019, this period of 777 days. This is um, the period of time in which this battle with Sisera occurs, right? But we know that this oppression has been going on longer, right? So this oppression goes back to 9-11, right? So this is a zoom into the formalization of the first angel's message in this bigger line, right? From 9-11 to 2023. So even though there's reforms in here, there is a darkness that has continued and that darkness is an enemy that's been left in the land. Now, Parminder who has come into the movement before 9-11 is going to be uh, the person who is bringing this oppression to the movement. I mean, that oppression has been there always, but he's now going to be, because that oppression comes from Jabin, the king of Canaan, right? And so that enemy, we could mark at 9-11 as being spiritual formation. Right. So Parminder's teachings embodied this error. Can we agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. His whole method of teaching, um, his uh, use of deception, all of these are Jesuit. Um, Mindset. Yeah, it's a Jesuit way of working. Right. So he's working. As a Jesuit, I'm not saying he's a Jesuit because that would be ridiculous. He doesn't have the training of a Jesuit, never went to Jesuit institutions, right? But he still has been influenced by those thinkings, that thinking that's in the world. And, and he's a liberal pretending to be a conservative. So, so he has an agenda. And so he's in this movement prior to 9-11. But at 9-11, uh, spiritual formation is... In September of nine, uh, in September of two thousand and one, spiritual formation is set in a document by the Adventist Church, where they have made this agreement with the evangelicals in order to have our institutions accredited by these worldly Christian universities. We need to accept spiritual formation and use it in the instruction of our pastors, even though our pastors aren't going to be hired by these other churches. I have no idea why they're doing this, but other than apostasy in the church. So this happens in September of 2001. And this, this is the enemy that's going to be tackled. It's remained in the land and it's, it's affected this movement. And, and this is going to be embodied in Parminder's teachings. Now, 
Parminder is and Tess are going to combine together to come up with this date, November 9th, 2019. So we know that in, in arriving at this date, they have used dispensational arguments for time setting. That is, Ellen White's statements regarding time setting do not apply to our dispensation, something which I soundly rejected in 2018. So when I understood that we were using time setting, I knew that there were things that Parminder and Tess were saying that were correct, but I knew this idea that we could somehow just set aside Ellen White's statements against time setting were wrong. And so I made the argument that we weren't making, we weren't setting dates contrary to Ellen White's statements, that this had to refer to something internal within this movement, that we, we weren't addressing her line at all. So when she talks about time setting, Ellen White is talking about time setting in the context of the bigger line. And so I knew that the time setting we were doing was a special case because of our repeat of history, not because we were abandoning Ellen White's statements as not relevant to Adventism. So it was a very different way in which I accepted the setting of dates than Parminder and Tess did. Now, I'm not sure how Jeff looked at it because um, in 2018, in the meetings that he did at uh, Pigeon Lake in Alberta, um, the ones there at, uh, um, that ended on August 11th, 2018, uh, those presentations, he's he seems to be accepting his arguments that he has made in the past against time setting, but he somehow, and I could never figure it out how he was accepting Parminder's time setting, except that since time applied to the Millerites and we already had time in our line, then time must apply to us. But that seemed to me that Jeff was supporting my view is that this was this repeat of history that had the time attached to it. Which means that Jeff must have understood on some level that we were addressing a different line than the line that Ellen White had. So when Tess does these presentations, so we know that there's gonna be here, I'm just gonna put this in the three, the 391.5 days. This is going to be from October 18, 2018, right? Tess, October 18, October 13, 2018. And we know that Tess is going to have on October 3rd, these two presentations called The Midnight Cry and 10 Years, right? So these two presentations happen 10 days before this is actually what we call the midnight cry. So this is the midnight cry on some line, right? We never really defined what this line is. Um, we, we sort of said this might be like the line of the priests, but that didn't really make much sense. And then that this would be midnight for this being the midnight cry. So that's initially how it was done in 2018. Um, but so they made this prediction about November 9th. Um, so they have this November 9th prediction. But 10 days later, I confirm this date, but they're going to call this, they're going to say this is the close of probation, right? So they're going to say close of probation for the priests. Right now, in their understanding of the close of probation, what what was definitely being evident by the followers of Parminder and Tess is that they would now be perfect. That this was a close of probation where let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him that is filthy be filthy still, and that idea was not just Parminder's followers, um, but even continued 
within this movement after Jeff woke up on September 7th, right? So we're gonna have here uh, nine, seven, that's gonna be 63 days before this. Um, still believing that somehow they needed to be perfect so that they could be sealed so that they would never be tempted again and all that kind of stuff. So that was still happening even with people in the Canadian group after this date. Um, now I made an argument at the camp meeting. So I'm on October 13th, I, um, I noticed this. The next day on the 14th, I do a presentation called Some Calculations. Parminder's there. He sees this, 391.5. He's actually listening to my presentation, something he never does, um, and actually even comments on it. And he, and he says, you need to present this at the camp meeting. So I already had notes for the camp meeting of what I was presenting, um, uh, which had to do with uh, the week of Christ study that I was going to be presenting at the camp meeting. And, but then I, he wanted me to present about this 391.5. So he was, I was given, um, I think two more presentations to do that, um, if I remember correctly. And, um, and I actually even did another 10 minute presentation before one of his on Sabbath, because that's when I actually found about uh, some of these other details. And so, so there's lots that's going on in here, but when I do my presentation regarding November 9th, that's the two presentations on the 391.5 days, um, I'm going to be um, making this quite clear that this close of probation can't be a close of probation where the hymn that is righteous is righteous still that it becomes a separation in the movement itself and that some of the people in the movement will have closed their probation as far as rejecting light, but that isn't the close of probation where people are going to can not, you know, not say they're going to be righteous somehow, somehow sealed or something like that. But the people who pass this test aren't going to be, they, they're still going to have more tests that they have to pass, Right. The people who failed this test, they failed. So that was my argument. And I present that in the cap meeting that begins on October 16th. So, um, so that was, that's just that history, a bit more about that history. Now, of course, this 63 days, we remember that over here, we're going to have this June 9th date and June 9th, 2018. And this is going to be where we count the 126 days. So this just lines up with Samuel Snow's letters, right? With Samuel Snow's letters, as we know, you're going to have February 16th. Um, this is all in 1844. And then you're going to have the six days and his, his letter is going to be published. And then it's going to be and this date here is the date for the dedication of the temple. This is going to be um, the uh, on the biblical calendar, the, the third day of the 12th month, right? And then it's going to be published on April 3rd again. And this date here is the Passover but, you know, the wrong one, the one the Jews had. But if you go to Ezra chapter six, it's going to talk about the dedication of the temple on the third day of the 12th month and then the Passover that follows. So this was something that tied me to the book of Ezra. So, you know, whatever you want to call it there, 40 days in there. Um, something like that. And then uh, you're going to have... Uh, April 19th, and then you're going to have May 2nd, and then you're going to have June 22nd, right? And then you're going to have July 18th. So these are the main waymarks. All of these are going to be matched in 
this slide going from uh, June 9th, June 15th, which is 100, so you got the six days, 100. Uh, so this is going to be June 15th. That's going to be 120 days before um, this date, which is going to be April 19th is going to line up with August 11th. So actually, it's not before that date. That's going to be before this date, which is going to be October 13th. Right. And this here is going to be just August 11th, Julian. Right. This is Gregorian. And this is going to line up with July 27th. So this is going to be Daniel from Brazil making the prediction. of the 126 days itself, right? So this 126 days is matched by this 126 days, right? And um, then this in, uh, in Samuel Snow's letters, of course, is 26 days. But if you put a year in 26 days, you get 391. And that's going to bring us to from October 13th to November 9th, uh, 2019. So one of the things is that in this history, this is, if we go from this Pentecost letter and we count 391, it would bring us to July 18th. So I could do this. Right. So this, these, this, both of these create a July 18, this one, July 18, 1844. But if I take this and apply the 391 and a half, I get to July 18, 1845. So, so you can see what I'm saying is this is how we came to July 18, one way that we confirmed it. And we saw this structural chiasm of these 63 days. And 63 days uh, with April 19th as the center. And in this case, it's August 11th, um, 2018, that ends up being the center of this structure here. So, so this to me was very, very profound. And so this ends up fitting into this, this structure. So we have all of these dates. Now, when we try to look at Samuel Snow's line itself, so we take Samuel Snow's line, I mean, we're going to have, you know, the first letter, it's published, it's republished. So this would be the arrival, the formalization, and the empowerment of the message, correct? Does that make sense? It would seem that way. Okay. And then we're going to have the second letter, right? So the second letter arrives here. And that's going to be about the midst of the week. Okay. Now the second letter arrives and then you're going to have um, its formalization and empowerment. Correct. That's what we would normally say. Right. Okay. So then, you know, we could say that this is its arrival, its formalization formalization and its empowerment or we could look at the fact that this is formalized here it's written here and but it's going to be pub published here this third letter so that's going to be on the, the 29th and this is that third day of the sixth day of the third month and the 11th day of the third month and if you double the 11th day of the third month it becomes the 22nd day of the sixth month right that's that little thing so you could say this is all a formalization and that this is the empowerment. And then that July 21st is going to be the arrival of the third, right? So you would put midnight here, July 21st, and that definitely would be the third angel arrives. So, so I'm gonna take, this is all uh, the formalization. This is the empowerment. And this is the third angel arriving. 
So in this line of Samuel Snow's letters, we can see that this is, um, if this is the formalization and this is the empowerment, so whether this is right or wrong, I don't know. Because if this is a formalization, this is the empowerment, we don't have this represented on this line. So October 13th, when we say it's the midnight cry, um, it could be that we could take this line and somehow make this the empowerment. But the formalization also can be a midnight cry. So this would end up being midnight in this context, and this would be the midnight cry in this line. So when we said this was the midnight cry, the question is, were we correct, or was this some other line, right? So, because I don't see how we could make this the midnight cry on this line, because this isn't the midnight cry on this line. Does that make sense? Now, I could do it a different way. So, what I could do is this. I could say that April 19th is the arrival of the second angel message. Because it is, right? And that Samuel Snow's letters are a zoom into the arrival of the second angel's message or a zoom into the second angel's message. And if I do that, then this is the formalization and this is the empowerment and the empowerment would be the midnight cry. So does that make more sense? People understand what I'm doing. I know you can't really see this bottom part here. They're still kind of working that through. Okay. I think this makes the most sense because then we can say that this history here is Samuel Snow's letters, right? And that in Samuel Snow's letters, we can draw a reform line where he's a zoom into this, the, the second angel's message arriving. Okay. We have a question from the chat. Okay. As to why you didn't place the midnight cry on July 18th. Uh, well, because in this line, it wouldn't work. Because it's for a, a separate line altogether. Right. Right. So what, what we need to look at is Samuel Snow's letters. What is his line doing? What are, what are the letters? Well, we call them the prediction before midnight. So we know midnight is July 21st on this other line. And his line goes up to July 18. So July 18 has to be the, the arrival of the third angel in that context. So I wouldn't put the third angel around. It would be the midnight cry if July 21st was the arrival of the third angel's message. But when we did that, it didn't line up with our history. Right, October 13th would be lining up with a thing that was midnight, but that doesn't make sense because we said it was the midnight cry and I believe that it was in Samuel Snow's letters, in the repeat of history, the repeat of Samuel Snow's letters, we had this very specific declaration that October 13th was the midnight cry. And we had these presentations 10 days before the midnight cry, that was 10 years and the midnight cry that showed that October 13th was the midnight cry for whatever line we were in. But the line that we were in was the line of Samuel Snow's letters that are a zoom into this separation uh, of April 19th between the two Passovers, the true Passover and the false. This was how I understood it in 2017. So that these two Passovers actually are attached to here. That is there on either side. And in Millerite history, if your disappointment was April 19th, 
that means you've, you've accepted this Passover. But if this was the Passover that you believed in 1844, that means your disappointment was March 21st, really, right? Because you, you, didn't, you didn't accept this Passover. So the people who accepted this chronology of this Passover, those people came to the 1335, which is here. And then they're going to be in the tearing time. And those that receive the, that are benefited by the first message can, can be benefited by the second. But these people can't. And so my argument was that Samuel Snow's letters were showing this separation in the movement that um, I believe had occurred in 2017. It had already occurred. Um, over the previous few years, but as we start to, started to look at this and we started to understand this is Samuel Snow's letters, well, this is really leading to this separation that happens on November 9th, right? Because remember, Samuel Snow's letters, the June 18th letter is typifying October 22nd, 1844, because it's 187 and October 27, 22nd, 1844 is the 187th day of the year. So this line here, what, what we were going through is, again, typifying this line specifically. November 9th becomes the arrival of the third angel's message. In this line of Samuel Snow's letters, October 13th is the midnight cry. And then we can see that this, this aligns here with Samuel Snow's letters. We can't ignore the April 19th date. We can't just jump from here to here. But I just wanted to show you that if we did that, what would happen is it wouldn't line up with our history. So we can see then that the, the date that lines up with April 19th is August 11th. And August 11th is, of course, relating to Josiah Litch's prediction. And we know that this line is going to then utilize this history here to then show July 18th in Samuel Snow's letters as this sort of parallel or pair that goes with November 9th. So then when we put July 18th after November 9th, 252 days after, right? So you get this here, this July 18, 2020. Then we can see how this is, um, this all fits. Right? It all makes sense. Everything that we, we had here in, in our history now makes sense as a line. And that we can see specifically what we were, when we were saying this was the midnight cry, that's because we were lining it up with Samuel Snow's letters that produced June 22nd as the midnight cry. And I say June 22nd, those, that letter that's published on June 29th. Or June 27th, right? Five days later, June 27th, right? July 18th letters written on June 29th. So, so these are the way marks we have. And these are the way marks we have. They're parallel with each other. They show that July 18th and November 9th go together. That you can't have July 18th or you can't have November 9th without July 18th following it. Is that sort of, whoops. Sorry about that. Okay. That makes sense to people. I think it's going to take a little bit to really sink in. Okay. Well, I'll leave it there for now. <clears throat> so to me, what's, what's clear? Well, that's, that's not clear. I don't know why that keeps happening. 
um, so what's here clear to me by these lines is that when we yeah, when we talk about a line and we talk about the way marks in a line, we need to know what line we are in. And we had this problem in the past that we would talk about something like October 13th being the midnight cry, and nobody knew what line we were talking about. Now, I would say it was in the line of Samuel Snow's letters. But that didn't mean anything to anyone, because even though they might know about Samuel Snow's letters, we had never drawn out the line in this way saying that his first letter is the arrival of the first angel, its publishing is the formalization, and its empowerment is the republishing in the signs, right? the signs of the times, instead of just in the Midnight Cry periodical, which wasn't read by very many. And then um, the arrival of the second angel being April 19th, even though it's not one of his letters, it's an integral part of his letter in this structure of the 126 days, that is, we put April 19th as the center of a chiasm, just as we do with May 2nd being the center of the entire uh, letters from February 16th to July 18th. And so that's the one thing I didn't have in 2017. I didn't really have April 19th as a waymark at May 2nd as the arrival of the second angel, so to speak. But but I wasn't really marking it that way. So this April 19th date becomes important and it's tied to the August 11th date in, in our history in 2018 as the center of a chiasm. And then you can see why August 11th and the July 27th date for the prediction that Daniel from Brazil made, why those are so important in how we later used um, both Ezekiel which has the 391.5, and the prophecy of Revelation 9 by Josiah Litch. Um, and remember, Ezekiel's, the, his 390 and 40 are based up on the prophecy of Josiah. So we noticed this back in 2016. So now we have these brought together. And so we can look at this line. We can look at the way marks. They fit perfectly with his letters, and they fit perfectly with what we proclaimed October 13th to be before we even understood how to draw out this line of Samuel Snow's letters as a reform line. So once we, once we had July 18th and we saw the connection with Samuel Snow's letters, then we can say, well, it's obviously not something that could happen by chance. And so that midnight cry declaration on October 13th was correct, but only if we understand these lines correctly. And, and this is just, to me, it's just so obvious now of what we're doing because we can understand then that in 1844, here is the problem. So I'll just back up. So Parminder is teaching that these lines are happening in a staggered fashion and that way marks do not typify each other. He's presenting a dispensational application of prophecy. He, his lines don't match anything in Millerite history. So if we're repeating this Millerite history, why do we have all of these staggered lines in this sort of I would say simplified fashion that Parminder had done that are inconsistent internally and inconsistent with Millerite history. When now we can see what we are doing is we're looking at Waymarks are typifications because each Waymark is in itself a reform line. And so we looked at Millerite history. We could see Miller had a reform line that deals with the arrival of the first angel. So Samuel Snow has a reform line that deals with the arrival of the second angel. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so and, and this line fits perfectly. 
fits perfectly with our history. This line that we had that we we labeled an event, the midnight cry. But now we know what line it is. It's repeating the line of Samuel Snow's letters. So, so when we go to this line that we developed of the 777 days, this is a zoom into the formalization of the first angel in this bigger line, which we call the line of the judges, right? Because this is the judges line, right? So the judges right. line gives us these seven right. numbers. And we're saying that this 777 is a zoom into that formalization of this judges line. And the judges line addresses the darkness that has been in this movement since 9-11. So we can see that even in, um, even in this line, we still are addressing that darkness. And in fact, each way mark in a reform line is always addressing the darkness. It's not just the first uh, increase of knowledge that happens from when the first angel arrives. The darkness exists throughout the line because that line is a reform line and light comes at the time of the end when the first angel arrives. But that light needs to continue to grow and be accepted. So it's always been a bit misleading just to say this increase of knowledge happens here at the beginning because it happens all along the way. And not just when an angel arrives, each way mark, because each way mark is a reform line, it also has to deal with a period of darkness before that way mark that then is, is being addressed by that way mark as a reform line. So that's what Deborah and Barack is doing. So it's continuing a message that began at 9-11, which first introduces this work of the Holy Spirit that awakens and brings conviction, the 2520 and this chronology specifically that then is formalized from October 13th, 2018 to September 7th, 2019. But when we look at this line, it goes further back because it's going to first deal with this first part about this invitation, right? So this invitation, which is to me personally, but this line in a sense relates to that message because the message that we have here is the message of Josiah, uh, or not Josiah, of Samuel Snow. And Samuel Snow's message is a continu continuation of that which was given before of Miller and Litch. And so that's why we have this reform line here in this fashion. Now, then it's also a zoom into um, this formalization of the first message. But its, it's arrival of the second message in this line is October 13th. So this is not, so when we look at this line here, this line is not, this line of Deborah and Barack, is not the line of Samuel Snow's letters. The line of Samuel Snow's letters fits in here, but it's going to go from June 9th to October 13th, Right? So if, if I'm going to take what we put on the board and place it in this line, we can take this, the 126 days, my computer's freezing up here. So Not enough take, real estate. Yeah. So, um, so that's going to be the 126 days there. So if we if we think about this, then um, Samuel Snow's letters is the special special message 
regarding time that's going to begin on June 9th, right? And it's going to be proclaimed. So, so that line itself is going to have um, the midnight cry on October 13th. Right. So, and so that's going to be June 22nd in Samuel Snow's letters. And July 18th will line up with November 9th over here. But it's this 126 days. And you can see the 63 days over here, how that's related. So there is another period of 126 days um, that's going to go to January uh, 11th, 2020, that Jeff notes. But Samuel Snow's letters themselves from the 1st to the 3rd are going to give us up to October 13th. And so that pre produces that line. So October 13th is the midnight cry in that line. But it's not the midnight cry in this line of Deborah and Barak, right? So we can see that in this line itself, there's going to be another midnight cry. So we have a midnight cry here, but we're going to have a midnight cry here. That is September 7th, 2019. If we're following what we have done before, has to become the midnight cry in that sense, because it's the empowerment of the second angel. And could we liken what Jeff does on September 7th, 2019 as the midnight cry? I think, think we, we easily can. Now, we're going to address these other points. Because we still have Was that date when he woke up. Yeah, that's the date when he woke up and he did the last sermon at Lambert Church. I agree. Then we I'm sh sure that we could do what you had suggested. OK. OK, so we're going to go back to the scriptures here. <clears throat> So then when we address these different points, so we had the arrival of the message as being um, this invitation. So that's where we have to try to address that first angel's message. The first angel's message we said had to do with the invitation. And then there is um, maybe the ne negotiation and the acceptance. Yeah, I know I'm not sharing the Bible yet. So we're looking at the questions there. So we got June 9th, 2018. And we're going to, we're going to have to line that up with uh, this invitation, right? So when we go here, it gives us this period of darkness, this oppression, the 20 years of oppression. We tied that in to, uh, the period from 9-11 up to 2019 and, and actually to 2017 to 19. And then Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidus, she judged Israel at that time. Now, I want to bring up something I said, which was wrong. Now, um, there is a connection between. Um, so Deborah means a bee. Now, Lapidus means. What was what did we say that Lapidoth was? Dwight? I'll look it back up. Okay. Was that a flame, a lamp or a flame? Yeah, so a torch. And then and Dwight said something about the, the form of the word. That it was a feminine form, right? Correct. That's what Brown Drivers Briggs says. Uh, but it's not. So it's it's not the feminine form. Uh, the form of the word is an intensive, if that's the right way of saying it. Uh, um, so, so it isn't it isn't feminine. It's 
a masculine plural of like an um, like, like an emphatic form or like a strong form of the word. So it's not feminine, even though it looks like the feminine form. How did you come to that conclusion? Uh, by looking in my Hebrew grammars. So Thank you. I don't want to bring you through that whole process. Um, yeah, so so this is what they, they call the emphatic form, uh, masculine plural emphatic. Okay, so it looks similar to a feminine form uh, when they translate it. Um, and, and it fools people all the time because it's not very common. So, so anyway, that's what this is. Now, um, so the idea here is that it's more like a doubling. So you pluralize it to make it emphatic. Okay, so you're, you're doubling it in a certain way. Well, they did, they did say it was torches in the... Right, so it's plural, right? But they plural. feminine plural. But it's not. It's a masculine plural. And, we, and you consider it as an intensifier. Yeah, it's 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 a way of doubling a word that it's it's more intense. It's it's emphatic. Now, so so that's that's what I understand from the reading I did, and that's what other. I mean, I could if people really need to get the references, I could dig them up again. I didn't write them out, um, but but that's that's what we see here in this word lapidoth, and. Um, now, the other thing is, I said that uh, it relates to uh, lapis. Well, it doesn't. That's what, what we call a false etymology. Uh, lapis, with it, which is a butterfly. And then I said a lapidary was like a place where you keep butterflies or something. But that's not true. A lapidary has to do with um, uh, polishing stones. So, so they're just yeah. another false etymology there. But the point is we have this bee and we have this, these torches. And, and even though there is no actual connection that I could find between torches and butterflies, uh, etymologically speaking, in the origins of these words, we do know that butterflies like to fly around torches, right? So I, I hope I'm not stretching this here, but I want to see a connection between the bee and the butterflies. Moths that like to fly around. Yeah, moths, butterflies. They're just another name for the same thing. Right? I mean, they're related in some ways. But in a lot of ways. Yeah. So to me, this, uh, and, and they compromise, I think, 10% of all the species on the earth or 20% or some ridiculous number. Uh, there's lots of rare variations of butterflies. They're also, uh, the Achilles heel to the evolutionary arguments because they have no way of explaining how you can have uh, something like a butterfly develop through uh, small changes in uh, genetics because the leap that would be needed to be made uh, to get the whole idea of, uh, you know, the butterfly with its cocoon and the, what's the word, the chrysaliths, you know, all that forming and something gradually, it just couldn't happen. They have no way of explaining that mechanism. But anyway, uh, that's just a whole other story. So even though Lapidoth is not connected to butterflies, I'm connecting it through false etymology, which which I'm allowed to do. Because, because why? We do have a precedence, don't we? Uh, for false etymologies? Well, for... Uh... Not necessarily the etymologies, but other things that um, that have come in that were false, and we still basically used them. Yeah, and well, you know, like uh, an example of a false etymology would be saying that uh, Easter is connected to Ish, right? Yeah, turn off your mic there. Sorry. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, you know, if you try to connect Easter with Ishtar, there's just no etymological connection, right? That, you know, Easter, the name Easter comes from uh, northern pagan, uh, you know, uh, god names, right? Nothing to do with Ishtar. But we know that there is at least a connection between Easter and and the false worship of paganism, right? So even though we have a false etymology there, people still use it all the time. And so in that way, we can connect it. But uh, why am I concerned about the butterfly connecting the butterfly to Lapidoth, even though it deals with torches? Well, you mentioned um, the bee. Yeah. So, so we, evidently, you're trying to connect it with the FF, 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 yeah, FFA. Okay. Yeah. So, so we got to be now. Do we connect butterflies to FFA? Because what's the butterfly a symbol of? Rebirth. Yeah, rebirth, right? The resurrection. Because, you know, the, the little caterpillar spins its cocoon, turns into a chrysalis, and then breaks through and becomes uh, this butterfly, right? And um, so I think the symbol there, if we're, if we're going to look at who Deborah is, because we're saying that Deborah... She dwells under the palm tree of Deborah, right? So we're going to say that the palm tree represents Jericho, the 2520, uh, between Ramah and Bethel. And Ramah and Bethel are going to, now, now Stephen's not here, but I have his uh, uh, message that he sent me. <clears throat> so he says, both Ramah and Bethel become places for the school of the prophets, and we know that the school of the prophets first started at Jeff's place and then moved to um, uh, to the location later on Bumblebee Road, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so in Judges 4, verse 5, it says, And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah, which we just read. In Samuel's day, there were two of these schools, one at Ramah, and the home of the prophet, and the other at Kirjath Jerem, where the ark then was. Others were established in later times. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, 593.2. So Ellen White says that Rama and uh, what had a school of the prophets. And there was also one at Kirjath Jerem, where the ark then was. Um, and the other school where the ark was. Uh, links it to Arkansas, right? Right, so we've, how did we connect Arkansas to the Ark? Uh, I saw the Ark in Arkansas or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. As Elisha accompanied the prophet on his round of service from school to school, his faith and resolution were once more tested. At Gilgal and again at Bethel and Jericho, he was invited by the prophet to turn back. That's page Prophets and Kings. 225.2. Um, so, so we can see here that we can connect these to um, Rama and Bethel. Now, I looked on uh, Google Earth and I drew a line uh, between um, uh, the building there at the School of the Prophets, the main building, and a line going over to Lambert Church. And now Jeff isn't exactly right in the middle. You know, you have this line. And, and he's just a little bit to the north um, northeast of that line and just a little bit to the left. So I guess that would be the northwest of the center of the line. Uh, you know, within, you know, a few hundred meters or whatever, right? So, um, so he's pretty close to being the center, but he definitely is between the two places. Right, especially as as you you drive, you know the you you just drive past his road, you know you have to go a 
few hundred meters down this road in order to get to his place. But you, you drive past his intersection there uh, to go between um, the School of the Prophets and Lambert Church. So, so we're saying that, that um, the Deborah represents this, um, this movement, FFA, right? And, and is That's the wife, what our studies have led to. Yeah, and, and she's the wife of Lapidoth, of this butterfly. Um, so, I mean, we could say the torches, and so that's fine. But, but I like the, the, the idea that these torches can be connected to this symbol of rebirth. Because when we look at this movement at the present time, the movement appears as, is, is, as if it is falling, right? But we know that this is what happens when the sinners in Zion are sifted out, right? So there's a work that's going on right now um, that relates to this, this message. So whether that's, you know, the best thing to do, you know, to compare it to butterflies or not, that's just what I like to do. Even if, we, like just it. It to, even if we just keep it with the torches, uh, we know that this message is a bright and shining light. But the other thing is um, uh, we can also connect Lapidoth to the spirit of prophecy because of the torches, the bright and shining light, right, Ellen. So, and, and this is, of course, a central part of our message is understanding that we accept the spirit of prophecy. There are lots of other reform movements in Adventism that don't. And Parminder, did he accept the spirit of prophecy? No. No. So you can see that this battle, to some degree, is over the spirit of prophecy. I seen that when I first joined Adventism. I, I noticed it right away because, um, oh, you can't say that because she didn't really mean that. Wait a second. Um, it's plain language and it can be applied to almost any situation. Yeah. How is that, you know, how is that? <laughs> she's a prophet or she isn't, yeah. Well, she's a yeah. writer, right? You know, we take her as a devotional writer within Adventism. Right. And maybe a good nice. historical source about the history of Adventism. She's a nice lady. But, you know, we don't, we don't match her up with the Bible. Because she says the Bible is the greater light, right? And, and of course, we know the Bible is the standard. But that well, yes, mean. but we also know that she is the lesser light. Right. But she is still a prophet who is That's writing right. God's word. Exactly. And, and so we, we take more than a prophet. Yeah. But I know mm -hmm. I struggle with that. And I know that, uh, you know, I struggled with that as an Adventist. Um, but I kept sticking to the fact that if Ellen White was writing things that were error, we, we couldn't trust her. So I kept examining her writings to find the error. And, and when I did find things that I thought were error, I would set those on the back burner instead of, you know, saying, well, Ellen White's wrong here because I knew my understanding was lacking. And then I would continually find that she wasn't in error and the problem was with me. And I've done the same with the Bible. I assume that the Bible is, is God's word and that it's true. And that if there's, a contradiction between my thinking and the Bible. The problem is my thinking. Amen, brother. And that's how I approached studying chronology. So people have a hard time doing that. We tend to think what we think is correct. We don't like to be corrected by others or even by God's word. <clears throat> so, so anyway, we have Deborah where she dwells, right? So, uh, this has to do with the school of the prophets. And we know that that um, the date of June 22nd has to do with FFA and that the center date of that is uh, December 21st, 2012, of uh, June 22nd, 2011, and two, 20, uh, June 22nd, 2014. And it starts a period of 777 days. It actually starts a whole structure that encompasses 
all the way up to December 21st, 2021, with June 22nd, 2012 as the center, or 2012, June 22nd, 2017 as the center. So if you go from December 21st, 2012, and you go to December 21st, 2021, the center is at the end of June 22nd, June 22nd, between June 22nd and June 23rd is the center of that structure. And so there's a whole bunch of things to about that structure. So June 22nd, which is a symbol of FFA, relates to that those lines of Samuel Snow's letters. And um, so she's then going to send to Barak, the son of Abinuim, the, which means the father of plenty, plen, uh, pleasantness, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath the Lord God of Israel commanded, hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. Right? And so we know that this is an invitation. Uh, but this invitation relates to this idea of 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun. And Naphtali and Zebulun, the numbering of these tribes is significant. And 10,000 is significant. It gives us a date. And it gives us the date of March 27th. Right? I'm pretty sure that's what we worked out. Yeah, so, so since it gives us that date in two different ways, that is 10,000 days is uh, 27 years and um, 0.3 with more decimal after that. It symbolizes 273, March 27th. But also if we count it from um, November 9th, 2018, it will bring us to March 27th, 2017. And that March 27th, 2017 uh, has us connect to March 27th as a symbol, which we get March 27th, 2019, March 27th, 2020, March 27th, 2021, etc. And we know that in that line that we have drawn, one of the way marks that we place is March 27th, 2019. And that way mark is uh, the Waymark, where Jeff does a presentation called The Shut Door in 2019. Uh, that's on a Wednesday. On Thursday, the next day, he does a presentation called 1863. And um, so 1863, remember, we're going to have... Um, what, what do we do with 1863? in relationship to Zebulun. What did, what did Odilio do? So. <clears throat> so we have a closed door and then on March 28th, we have this 1863 sermon. So those two sermons, they're the last two sermons before the camp meeting where he passes the cloak over to Parminder. And then he's going to wake from that. So, um, anybody know the answer to my question? Repeat the question again, please. So, what what did Odilio do with the numbering of the tribes in relationship to 1863? I'm not sure because I still haven't read his report. Uh, so you're going to go from May 23rd, 1863 to July 18th, 57,400 days. That's the numbering of the tribe of Zebulun. Ugh! Right? right. So, I'm starting to remember this now. Okay. So, so we can see, and then we see that Naphtali is going to relate to uh, the falling of the stars. Or the dark day, pardon me. You know, that's the falling of the stars. Yeah, going up to 1980, the year in which I'm going to 
see the falling of the stars on August 11th. So there's a bunch of connections there. But the point that I want to bring out is having to do that when we deal with this Zebulun, that we're dealing with um, uh, these symbols um, that show up, right? So since we could go to the last day of the General Conference in 1863, if we go to the last day of the General Conference in 1888, and we use the number of Reuben, so Reuben's the firstborn, 46,500 of the tribe of Reuben. That's going to go to Parminder's ordination on February 26, 2016. And, and then Parminder's rebellion is going to be August 29th, 2019, 1,279 days later. Um, whatever that means as a symbol, I don't know. But... Um, we, we can connect the last day of these two with these spans of time. And so we can see that Parminder's rebellion is in contrast to uh, this study here dealing with July 18, 2020, which Parminder rejects. I know that's a rather long explanation of something. But what, what we can conclude is that these are all connected. So this March 27th date has a minor event, we might say, Jeff presenting a sermon, and then the next day presenting a sermon. Um, but the March 27th being the closed door, we know that this then, uh, if is, is the second angel's message talking about a closed door? Is it pronouncing a closed door? In Millerite history. I thought it was. Yeah. And so we can see our closed door is going to be the arrival of the third angel on November 9th. And on October 13th, of course, we're addressing that whole point of the closed door, right? Saying that this is the midnight cry. Now, this is the midnight cry in a different line than this line, right? This is just the arrival of the second angel. Correct. Okay. But we can see that part of this is when you go from October 13th to September 7th, Jeff wakes up, and the center date of that is March 27th, 2019. So that's going to connect back to his the shut door sermon. And, and then really with September 7th, he's going to be pronouncing a shut door because this is the the midnight cry, the empowerment of this message given on October 13th, first, or arriving on October 13th, formalized on March 27th, empowered on September 7th, and finally that door closes on November 9th, 2019. So this is about a message against Parminder and Tess's teachings. And that's going to start with this invitation. So uh, the June 9th, 2018 date, um, even though I don't know about it at this time, uh, this is really the ponderings, right, that go on from the invitation to the accept, the accepting the invitation. Okay. So then when we get to October 13th and we try to find this in this story, because that's what I, want, I was wanting to get done today, but we got like 12 minutes left. Uh, so we won't get it done, but <clears throat> we can at least kind of do a sketch of it and then go over it tomorrow. Okay. So if we go back to the scriptures here, we have this invitation. <clears throat> Um, and then um, this sort of the pondering of it or the negotiation of it, maybe we could call it too. Um, so she calls Barak, hasn't God told you this? Um, Take 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and I will draw thee unto the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So I'm going to say that this, this message here, this, I mean, this is part of the invitation, but this is what's going to happen. 
and after. So he's going to, of course, uh, accept the invitation. But we would have to say that this, this part of this message in this invitation, if you go out with me, then I will go, right? Um, that's going to be uh, October 13th, 2018. Can we say that Sisera is drawn to the river Kaishan? That that's that that's what's happening. This, this is where the battle comes to play. Is on October thirteenth that is it's going to arrive, and and we could probably even create a whole line dealing with October thirteenth itself. Even though we can say, well, maybe this line of Samuel Snow's letters is tied up to it, um, but there's a lot more history in here too that that isn't even in the Samuel Snow's letters line. So once we take this line of Deborah and Barak that we have October 13th, 2018, as the second angel arrives, we could actually zoom into that history and create another line, right? So each of these lines we can zoom into the way marks on them and create other reform lines. We're not going to do that because that just becomes much more a personal line about the development of the July 18 prediction itself. Um, So I hope people get what I'm talking about there. So if I switch back here, I guess I should do this just to, to write. So we're going to say that this is the river Kaishan. I'm going to put it like that. Okay, <clears throat> then, then we go back to the scriptures. So we know he accepts this invitation. That's going to be the previous way, Mark. Um, so he says, surely I will go with thee. And But then along with that is that uh, Sisera is going to be uh, sold into the hand of a woman, right? So it won't be to his, his honor. And so when I, when I look at that from a personal point of view, um, the woman here, and that's what we have to address is what JL really represents. Um, and I don't think we've fully grasped that and how we would put that on the line there. Um, but definitely during that time, uh, me bringing out the 391.5 coming up with July 18th, it, it is not, for me personally, doesn't, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, vindicate me from all the criticism that has been going on in this movement. I'm still um, being treated badly. Not that that bothers me personally. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. Um, because I know that it's God's God's message that's actually being um, rejected. Not th not nothing to do with me. Um, but I see that it, it's going to end up with me get, getting kicked out of FFA, right? Sent back to Canada. So, <clears throat> um, so those things we're going to have to figure out when it comes to JL and so forth. Now, um, so then Barak calls Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. So, so we know that this, I mean, we could put this as, um, now the Kaishan River is not meant mentioned here. It's mentioned in the previous one. Um, that we could have put Kaishan and we could have put Kadesh as this arrival of the second angel's message as marking it as October 13th. Um, but, you know, I would just say that this, this more would be uh, the formalization of the message. And then what we're going to have, um, so Judges 4, verse 10, uh, is verse number 6,610 in the Bible, right? So 
661 represents FFA because six is F and one is A. <clears throat> so that's around there, just showing us that point. And, and so what we have to do is we have to take this part, we have to take the, the battle being set up um, and the battle itself, and then we have to address what it means when JL puts uh, the nail through the head of Cicero. And, and what event would we then mark? And normally what I would do, so again, we're just doing this temporarily. So I'll go back to the chart. <clears throat> And I'm going to put uh, JL and Spike. OK, now, whether that's correct or not, again, we're just we're just trying things out. Now, why would I put JL there as the arrival of the third angel's message? Because what I what I can do here is I can simply put uh, Kadesh and then I can put here the battle. And then I would have I'll just put battle. And then I'll have JL in the spike. So does that make sense? And so we can see that the message of Deborah about what is going to happen, it's part of the invitation. Um, but it is also the arrival of the second angel because it's providing this information regarding what's going to happen. Um, so even though in the invitation, initially it's gonna be talking about the river Kaisha, I'm putting it here as that this is going to be a, what's going to happen. And then we are gathered at Kadesh and there we're gonna have the 10,000, right? Which we say represents March, Oops, what am I doing here? 10,000. That represents March 27th above, right? And Kadesh also means holy, right? Or the holy place. And March 27th is tying us to the symbol of the Levites that work in uh, the sanctuary in the holy place, right? And then we have... Uh, this battle, and that's an empowerment of the message. And why is the battle the empowerment? Well, because Sisera is going to lose that battle. But he escapes, and he has these 63 days here for when Jeff awakens till this close of probation. And pretty much a death is a mark of a close of probation, correct? We could do that. Okay. So I, I actually managed to get these in here. I didn't think we could do it that quickly. But I think this makes sense. Whether you think it makes sense or not is another story, right? So you have to decide whether this makes sense or not. <clears throat> but it shows us that, that Parminder is dealt with he loses the battle, right, of September 7th. That's the victory, you know, for Deborah. But then we have JL. We're, we're going to have to address JL in more detail again. <clears throat> because JL puts the spike through the head of Sisera, closing his probation. But J JL is the arrival of another message. And so, so we're going to have to look at that. 
uh, tomorrow. And any uh, thoughts about this? I know, you know, it's lo always lots to think about. So BRAC represents this message of chronology that's going along The Deborah and BRAC are working together in this history uh, to bring about an end of Parminder's message. So Parminder believed that he was going to be taking over the movement, um, um, but he loses this battle. You know, he might think he won it because he got you know, mostly what he wanted, I guess, but he really wanted the School of the Prophets and Lambert Church, right? He wanted to have control of everything and he didn't end up that way. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, and we just pray for your blessing upon this day. Help us to consider these things until we come together again tomorrow and to continue to lay out these lines and to understand them. Uh, thank you for each person. Bless them. May your angels watch over us. And may you bring us together again according to thy will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.